الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعلنا ممن تحطهم برحمتك وتحفهم الملائكة يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We continue inshallah today our study of the life of Imam Abu Hanifa and we had stopped for about four sessions in our study of the life of Imam Abu Hanifa because we got to the point where we are studying the school of Abu Hanifa his school, the difference between the madhab of Abu Hanifa the way he followed the jurisprudence rules and some differences uh, among the other schools, the madhahib. And we uh, thought it is important for us to learn the terminology, to learn some of the definitions related to jurisprudence, to fuqah, so we can understand some of these differences. And inshallah, today we will try to finish our short study of the life of Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu an. And uh, we get to the point that we will, inshallah, study today the school of Abu Hanifa, like I said. There's come controversies around the Madhab al-Hanafi and uh, Abu Hanifa. We will try to highlight some of these and uh, respond to them like uh, our scholars uh, responded to them. And then we will study some of this, the lives or some of the role that the students of Abu Hanifa contributed to the spread of the Madhab al-Hanafi, to the, uh, the spread of the Hanafi school. Because if nothing else, the, the reason why we have uh, the, the widespread of only four madhahib is really the activity and the enthusiasm and the competence of the students that are around a certain imam. We know there, are only, there was many imam, Imam al-Thawri, Imam Layth ibn Sa'id, Imam al-Awza'i, etc., ibn Hazm, and uh, only these four madhahib that are now almost uh, completely dominate the Sunni world. And uh, the reason, uh, most scholars say the reason for that is those students. The students that carried the banner and continued the, the message and continue to uh, organize and continue to uh, uh, restructure this knowledge so it can form into the form of a school. Imam, uh, the Imma, the, the Madahib, started differentiating uh, because of what they follow in, in, in general as, like we said, the secondary sources of jurisprudence. We will come into that in a few minutes. But there was a, a major division initially between two major schools among the Madahib, and that is the Madhab of Al Madhab Al Athar, Madrasat Al Athar. And we went over that a uh, long time ago when we first started uh, studying the life of Abu Hanifa, but inshallah we'll go over a reminder. And this is a historical perspective about how the school divided. Initially, according to Imam Shahrastani in his book Al-Milal Wal-Nahal, he said, the Sahaba, after the Prophet ﷺ found themselves facing new situations, and they had to come up with new rulings, they have to come up with uh, new issues that, that were facing them. And, uh, most, and, and not all the Sahaba knew, knew all the hadith and all the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. So some of them had to depend on different things. One of it is trying to find an answer among other Sahaba. Did the Rasulullah ﷺ say anything about this situation? Did this face Rasulullah ﷺ? Did it face anybody that knew the Prophet and the Prophet knew about it? And then they will start asking each other for fatwa. And not all the Sahaba were Sahaba of fatwa. We knew that there was a, a few Sahaba that were known of their schools. They were known of their jurisprudence. And of them was Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Abbas, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, uh, and uh, others. And after that, in the second generation, the generation of the Tabi'een, this was a more critical time in our Islamic history. And that is when the fitna, the fitan, started spreading uh, more in the Islamic uh, world. And uh, the Muslim uh, 
the Muslim uh, religion has been divided into sects and groups, and there was some deviation of Al Khawarij, the deviation of Al Shia, the deviation of many other groups that started stringing up, and later on, uh, got, even the, the Khawarij became Izariqa and Ibadiyya, and they, there is a confrontation with new philosophies of the Western world that was going on at that time, and that. Um, uh, brought up also new division in Islamic creed and Islamic jurisprudence and new groups sprang up like Al-Jahmiya, Al-Qadariya, Al-Mu'tazila, the Mu'tazilite and that created a lot of division in the Muslim, uh, in the Muslim uh, 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 body. So it was very important for a tabi'een to start organizing that. And what happened also is something that never happened in the time of the Sahaba, that people started falsifying hadith on the Prophet ﷺ. They had different reasons. And they will do it in many different ways. And they will uh, bring a text that is, for, that is basically completely uh, false and say that Rasulullah ﷺ said that. And they will bring a senad, they will bring a chain of narration that is really strong to make it uh, look like it's really an authentic hadith. And some of it uh, was to uh, support their position that they're taking uh, in, in a certain matter. And uh, some also people responded by lying to bring people back to what they thought was the right path. And they when, when they were faced and they say, why are you lying on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The famous hadith, and it is a hadith that is mutawatir, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever tells a lie on my tongue, meaning saying, said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said so and so, or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never said and so, let them reserve their seat in hellfire, wal'iyadu billah. They have a seat reserved for them in hellfire, wal'iyadu billah. But then when they were, these people were asked, why are you lying on the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They said, we are not lying uh, on Rasulullah, we are lying for Rasulullah, we are lying for a good reason. And a lie is a lie, and a false hadith is a false hadith, and that is not an excuse uh, to, to lie. But this was what these people were facing. What Imam Abu Hanifa, what Imam Malik, what Imam Ahmed, and Imam Shafi'i were facing in their time. A lot of falsification, so they had to sift through these hadith. And that's why... Uh, there was started this major division between two things, two major schools. The school of textual evidence, Madrasa al the, the The imams that followed that were uh, trying to be as strict as possible to take a text, the, a narration from the Prophet wasallam, and follow that over their opinion. And they will uh, even follow a hadith that is not highly authenticated. It has to be, it has to reach a certain level of authentication. But it doesn't to be highly authentication. And they will say that is better than our opinion. And other imams like Abdul or Sahaba even like Abdullah bin Mas'ud uh, thought that because of this so, because of this is so important in our Islam that you should not tell something on the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ that you're not one million percent sure of, Abdullah bin Mas'ud will say, this is my opinion. This is هَذَا رَأْيِ And if it is true, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if it is wrong, it is from the shaytan. So they would say, our opinion, when we don't know the hadith that is a hundred percent sure of, is better than rely on a hadith that we are not sure of. So both arguments are not invalid. Both arguments are well taken. But then ulama started dividing across that spectrum. And it was not a clear uh, either black or white. There was a very large gray zone about how to go about these two schools. But on, on one side you see Imam Abu Hanifa who was more towards opinion. More towards working the intellect when you don't have a clear textual evidence. And we will see that. And on the other spectrum, you will see somebody like Imam Ahmed, who is a hadith scholar. Imam Ahmed, muhaddith. Musnad al-Imam Ahmed. He knows hadith. And he knows it inside out. And he knows hundreds of thousands of hadith. And he knows it very well. And that's why he was so dependent on textual evidence. 
Imam Malik was also more towards the textual school, but he also relied on many other uh, secondary sources of jurisprudence like al-Masalih al-Mursala, al-Qiyas, and etc. Imam Shafi'i is considered by many scholars of fiqh to be the middle, to be in the middle way between uh, Madrasat al-Athar wa Madrasat al-Ra'i. And we will get to that when we speak uh, about these great Imams. Most people of Ra'i were in Iraq. Most people that followed opinion were in Iraq. Most people that followed Athar were in Hijaz, where Imam Malik was, and the, the, it was called the Hijazi school. And it's easy to understand that. People in Hijaz, people in Mecca and Medina, are living with the people that lived with the Sahaba. That generation of Tabi'een lived with about 10,000 Sahabi that, that were teaching. So they had a lot of texts, they had a lot of references, and they knew how to use them. So they were more reliant on the textual evidence. Now people in Iraq, they had some great scholars like Abdullah bin Mas'ud, they had Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, they had many other big scholars, big Sahaba uh, in, in, in Islam, but still not as much as uh, was available in Mecca and al Medina. And we know through the lifetime and the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he did not allow Sahaba to leave Medina. It was prohibited for Sahaba to leave Medina at the time of Umar ibn Khattab, except with the permission and a mission from Umar ibn Khattab for a certain reason. So a lot of the Sahaba remained in Medina and lived in Medina. And the people of Iraq relied a lot on opinion based. These opinions always based on those principles that we explained in the last three or four sessions when we were studying basics of jurisprudence. In the time of Abu Hanifa, it was started, these things started to be very clear. That there is this, this big division. But in the late, late phases in the time of Abu Hanifa, the two schools, like I said, there was a great big gray zone in the two schools. And their, their opinions started to get, get together. Especially after a lot of traveling, a lot of textual evidence now was widespread in the Muslim Ummah. We know the hadith started being written in the hundred year after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu based on the orders of Umar ibn, al ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu an, and Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri was the first one that was given those, uh, this mission, but there was then many other people that started writing hadith. And Muwatta Imam Malik, Malik was in, in was Mu'asir, was, uh, he lived contemporary to Abu Hanifa at the same time, and they actually met. And Imam Malik wrote one of the very first early books of hadith in this, in our Islamic history, which is Muwatta Imam Malik. So the school started getting uh, closer together. These, this information was available to a large section of, of uh, scholars. And the, the traveling in the Muslim Ummah and the season of Hajj, we know how many times Imam Abu Hanifa went to Hajj. He met with Muhammad al-Baqir, he met with Imam Malik, he met with Ja'far al-Sadiq, he met with the Layth ibn Sa'id. So they were, there were meetings and these opinions were started to get closer together at the late time of Imam uh, Abu Hanifa. So the Aimma, uh, and you see this chart here on, on, the, on the slide, they differed in the secondary sources of jurisprudence and they also differed somewhat in their use of the primary sources of jurisprudence. And I meant by that, in the primary sources of jurisprudence are Quran and Sunnah. That the Prophet ﷺ said, I left in you two things, if you hang tight to them, if you bite on them, if you hold on to them, you will never go astray, you will never be misled. And that is the Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was sunnati, and my way, my path. And they, there were no differences, and these ulama about this are the two most important sources of jurisprudence. But when they went down to the secondary sources like we studied, you will see there are some differences. And our uh, main study today is Imam Abu Hanifa. So how did Imam Abu Hanifa uh, use these sources of jurisprudence? It is, uh, the, the uh, reference to that was in the book of Tariq Baghdad. And Abu Hanifa uh, stated the following. He, said, he was asked, how do you go about a ruling? How do you go about giving a ruling? 
Abu Hanifa said, Abu Hanifa said, أَخُذُ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ I take the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِنْ لَمْ أَجِدْ And if I don't find it in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَبِسُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. فَإِنْ لَمْ أَجِدْ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَلَا فِي سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أَخَذْتُ بِقَوْلِ الصَّحَابَةِ He said, if I don't find what I want in the book of Allah and in the sunnah of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, then I take the words of a sahabi, the ruling of a sahabi. And then he said, أَخُذُ بِقَوْلِ مَنْ شِئْتُ مِنْهُمْ وَأَدَعُ مَنْ شِئْتُ مِنْهُمْ He said, I take what I want and I leave whomever I want. And don't think this is arbitrary. Don't think that he, whatever he likes, he takes. And whatever he doesn't like, he doesn't take. We will come to that in a few minutes. So hang on, hang on for, for a few minutes on that. And then he said, وَلَا أَخْرُجُ مِنْ قَوْلِهِمْ إِلَىٰ قَوْلِ غَيْرِهِمْ He said, I don't go out of what they say to anybody else's. Meaning he doesn't use the word of tabi'een. He doesn't use قول tabi'een. Some other imams did. He said, أَمَّا إِذَا انْتَهَ الْأَمْرُ إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الشعبي وابن سيرين والحسن وعطاء وسعيد بن المسيب فأجتهدوا كما اجتهدوا. He said when it comes to other beyond the generation of the Sahaba like سعيد بن المسيب وابن ابن عطاء ابن سيرين then they they came to this conclusion in using their opinion, their intellect and their knowledge and I'm entitled to use my opinion, my intellect and my knowledge because there, he see, he saw no difference between himself and that particular generation. And that is no, there is no arrogance from Abu Hanifa in that. Abu Hanifa is considered a tabi'i himself. So he is speaking about comparing himself with people and with the same amount of knowledge in his same generation. And he said, قَوْمٌ اجتهدوا. They worked, they concluded, and I can conclude like they concluded beyond the words of the Sahaba. <clears throat> and other uh, were other references that actually uh, worded the methodology of Imam Abu Hanifa is what uh, wrote in Manaqib Abu Hanifa, Kitab al-Manaqib is what it's called, Lil makki And he said, Abu Hanifa akhada bi thiqa wa farra min al-qubah. He, he will take whatever is authenticated and he would leave things that he is not certain of. And then, wa nazar fi mu'amalat al-nas, that is urf. He looks how people deal with each other. And things that they uh, used to do. He goes with comparison. Qiyas, which is a major, major uh, source of jurisprudence in the Madhab al Hanafi. And then he said, فَإِذَا قَبَّحَ الْقِيَاسُ بَعْضَهَا يُمْضِيهَا عَلَى الْإِسْتِحْسَانِ And if he, if he thinks Qiyas will make things worse, comparison will make things worse, then he will use istihsan. Preference, and we study that, we'll go over that very quickly. Istihsan is when you leave the ruling of Qiyas for something that is better, for some, for a reason that makes more sense. مَا دَامَ يَمْضِلَهُ فَإِنْ لَمْ ضَمْضِلَهُ كَانَ يَرْجِعْ إِلَى مَا يَتَعَامَلْ بِهِ الْمُسْلِمُونَ If that doesn't work, then he goes to Urf, to so things that Muslims used to do with each other. وَمَا أَجْمَعُ عَلَيْهِ And agreement, agreement what is agreed upon among ulama al-Muslimin. And uh, so th this tells us the methodology of Imam Abu Hanifa in general. So Imam Abu Hanifa uses this sequence, this chain, like you see here. First Qur'an, then Sunnah, then the ruling of a Sahabi, then Ijma', then Qiyas, then Istihsan, and then Urf. And that is how the Madhab al-Hanafi goes, and usually in this particular order. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is we studied that and we studied how uh, the Sahaba, how the Sahaba used it and how the Imma used it and it is the first and the essential source of jurisprudence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ This book contains, encompasses everything and this book has been sent to people so it clarify and, and show people what uh, they should do in, in, the, in this dunya, in this life. And the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been the first source of jurisprudence for the Hanafi school, like it is for all other schools. There is no disagreement there. So we will pass on that for the interest of time. The next uh, source of jurisprudence is the sunnah 
of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is authenticated by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the second source you follow, like what he told Mu'adh ibn Jabal. If you don't find what you want in the Book of Allah, what do you do, Mu'adh? Mu'adh said, I, I follow the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Abu Hanifa, this is an important issue in, in the school of Abu Hanifa because the, crit, the critical, uh, the, the people that criticized Abu Hanifa accused Abu Hanifa of leaving the Sunnah and following his opinion. This is one of the accusations that the Hanafi school faces and Imam Abu Hanifa faces that he leaves Sunnah and he follows his own opinion instead of the Sunnah. So we will see how Abu Hanifa, this is uh, absolute, uh, uh, really, uh, it's his absolute misunderstanding of the position of Imam Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa himself in the book of Al-Mizan Lishaaran, he said, he said, كَذَبَ وَاللَّهِ مَنْ وَافْتَرَى عَلَيْنَا مَنْ يَقُولَ أَنَّنَا نُقَدِّمُ الْقِيَاسَ عَلَى النَّصْ وَهَلْ يُحْتَاجُ بَعْضَ النَّصْ إِلَى قِيَاسِ He said, those who say that we uh, make comparison before the textual evidence, they are lying, they are not telling the truth. Does anybody need comparison and if after there is a textual evidence? And then he said, نَحْنُ لَا نَقِيسُ إِلَّا عِنْدَ الضَّرُورَةِ الشَّدِيدَةِ We don't make comparison unless it's an absolute necessity. And he said, نَنْظُرُ فِي دَلِيلِ الْمَسْأَلَةِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَأَقْضِيَةِ الصَّحَابَةِ فَإِنْ لَمْ نَجِدْ دَلِيلًا قِسْنَا حِينَ إِذَنْ مَسْكُوتًا عَنْهُ عَلَى مَنْطُوقٍ بِهِ He said, we don't make comparisons and, and we reach opinion by our intellect unless when we search in the book of Allah, the sunnah of Rasulullah, then what the sahaba said, and then if we don't say, then we, started, we start working. Uh, this is confirmed in more than one reference. He said, مَا جَاءَ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ فَعَلَ الرَّأْسِ وَالْعَيْنِ بِأَبِي وَأُمِّي وَلَيْسَ لَنَا مُخَالَفَتُهُ وَمَا جَاءَ عَنِ الصَّحَابَةِ تَخَيَّرْنَا وَمَا جَاءَ عَنْ غَيْرِهِمْ فَهُمْ رِجَالٌ وَنَحْنُ رِجَالٌ This is the same thing just re-emphasized. He said, well, Rasul, the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is so important there is, that you cannot argue with the, with the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a given, it's something that we follow with that argument. But with the Sahaba we choose. He chose some of the uh, ruling of the Sahaba and he left some of it. And we will see that here just in a few minutes. He followed, like we said, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to be scrutinized in the time of the life of Abu Hanifa. Not the Sunnah itself, but how it reached Abu Hanifa, meaning the Senate, the chain of narration, because there has been a lot of falsification of hadith at that time, and these great scholars knew how to sift for it, and you can rest assured, like we studied in the last uh, few sessions, that this process is absolutely very meticulous, it is very well science-based, based on great knowledge of ilm al-hadith, and the, the Imma had some disagreement about how to use uh, some of the hadith. Now, uh, some of the hadith that went uh, in the chain of narration that is called al-hadith al-mutawadr, or repeatedly connected, were many, many sahaba, narrated from Rasulullah, narrated by many, many followers or tabi'een, by many, many tabi'i tabi'een, many, many followers of the followers, and in many narrators there is impossibility we cannot, these people cannot agree to falsify this hadith. This, this cannot happen by any stretch of imagination. This hadith is, this type of hadith is taken by all scholars. The second type of hadith is what is called al-hadith al-mashhur, where either the first or the second uh, layers of the hadith is narrated by one, two, or three sahaba. What is mashhur is there is some disagreement there. Some people say you can take one sahabi, some say mashhur. Most mashhur has to be about two or three sahaba to become a famous hadith or a mashhur hadith. And then after them, after that layer, many, many people narrated this hadith. Again, this reaches a very high level of authentication. So the first one they call martabatul yaqeen. The first one is absolutely, positively, unequivocally correct. This one they said, uh, this is qareebul yaqeen. This is close to absolute certainty. This is, you are certain, very, very certain that this hadith is correct and you take it. And all scholars took that. Now where some problems came, or not problems, but more of a disagreement, is what is called hadith al-ahad, hadith of single narration. 
single narration hadith is a sahih hadith. There is no doubt that this is a sahih hadith. It's been scrutinized. It's been looked at. But it is narrated by one sahabi, on one tabi'i, on one follower of a tabi'i, on, on narrators. And then it doesn't matter. But then the first, these first three chains, the first three layers, usually one, one upon one. So what do you do with this type of hadith? This is called a dhannu rajah. A dhannu We think that there is preponderance of evidence that this is a correct hadith. It is more likely to be correct than it is to be false. Because this chain of narration has been scrutinized. This sahabi is trustworthy. This tabi'i is trustworthy. This narrator is trustworthy. But there is only those sahaba. This is only that one chain of narration. And that's where uh, some of these uh, scholars disagreed. Should you take this hadith in matter of religion or should you not take this hadith in matter of religion? And Abu Hanifa actually was of the ones that uh, were and accepted, generally accepted hadith al-Ahad. In general, Imam had to make a general statement, Imam Hanifa accepted hadith al-Ahad. So number one, this really refutes that accusation that he would not accept sunnah and he will go over his opinion. This is actually a chance for Abu Hanifa not, because there is some disagreement out there. But generally, generally Abu Hanifa accepted this without uh, most of the time. But he had his own, he had scrutiny to this narration. Number one, what if you have two hadith and two of them are single, single narration, and which one do you take? So Abu Hanifa would weigh the knowledge of the narrators themselves. And this story, this coming story, tells us how that happened. Imam Awza'i and Imam Hanifa met together. And this is narrated by Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. So Imam Awza'i criticized Abu Hanifa. He said, مَالَكُمْ لَا تَرْفَعُونَ أَيْدِيَكُمْ عِنْدَ الرُّكُوعِ وَعِنْدَ الرَّفْعِ مِنْ When Hanafi makes salah, they don't uh, raise their hands when they go to ruku' and then when they, uh, when, when they get up from ruku' and etc. They do it only one time when they enter the salah and that is it. The other three madahib follow a different, uh, different hadith. So, Abu Hanifa said, لم يصح عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه كان يرفع يديه إذا افتتح الصلاة وعند الركوع وعند الرفع. He said it has not been authenticated from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that he did that. Imam Awza'i said, كيف? How do you, what do you say that? وقد حدثني, حدثني الزهري. Imam Zuhri, Ibn Shihab Zuhri, who one that started writing the hadith. The hadith from Imam Zuhri عن سالم ابن عبد الله بن عمر. On the authority of Salim of Abdu, ibn Abdullah ibn Umar, a great scholar. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar, himself on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa directly. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he goes to ruku', he would raise his hand. And when he get up from ruku', he would raise his hand. He said, this is, how do you say this is not authentic? It is an authentic hadith. Abu Hanifa said, حدثني حماد عن إبراهيم عن علقمة والأسود عن ابن مسعود أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان لا يرفع يدي إلا عند افتتاح الصلاة He said I have a hadith narrated from Hamad from Ibrahim Ibrahim al-Nakha'i that is from Alqama والأسود both two, two narrations in that one layer narrated from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Now you see here who's the shaykh who's, where does the knowledge of Imam, ibn Hanif, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa come from? Come from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud He was in Kufa and the Mashayikh, Imam al-Sha'bi, wa Imam al-Nakha'i, wa Hamad, all of them are students of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. So there is a natural bias towards the school that he was raised at. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud is thiqa. Abdullah bin Mas'ud is trustworthy. There is no doubt about that. But then he said, Al-Awza'i said, أُحَدِّذُكَ عَنِ الزَّهْرِ عَنْ سَالِمْ عَنْ أَبِي And you say, Hamad, عن, عن Ibrahim, عن... So, they now started, he said, I tell you Zuhri and Salim and, and, and his father, and you tell me Hamad and Ibrahim. I mean, how does that work? And Abu Hanifa said, Hamad kana afqah min al-Zuhri. Hamad was more knowledgeable than al-Zuhri. Wa Ibrahim kana afqah min Salim. Ibrahim al nakhai had more knowledge. Than, this is the opinion of Abu Hanifa now. Of course, that, you know, we're, we're not uh, trying to weigh, but this is how he weighed. We're trying to see his methodology. And then he said, وَلَوْلَ الصُّحْبَةِ 
لَقُلْتُ الْأَسْوَدْ لَهُ فَضْلٌ كَثِيرٌ عبد الله بن عمر, he can't touch Abdullah ibn Umar now, because he's a Sahabi. He said, if it is not for the Sahaba, for the companionship with the Prophet I would have said, Al-Aswad has a great advantage. So, this is how he weighed, uh, and this is how he took the opinion, and this is how he reached the conclusions when it comes to two hadith that had the same authenticity and the same narration. Another thing, he, like we said, he took it in general. Generally, when Abu Hanifa gets a singly narrated, single narrated hadith, he will take it in general. But then he rejected some of it. If he based qiyas, if he had a qiyas that is based on a very strong hadith, then he would leave that. Although this is qiyas and that is hadith. Now this is the direct uh, comparison between opinion and text. But if the opinion is based on a comparison with a very strong hadith, like a hadith mutawatir, he would take that over hadith al-ahad. He would take that over hadith al-ahad. If you go to Madhab Hanbali, they will take hadith al-ahad over comparison, even if comparison was dependent on a very strong hadith or authenticated hadith. So you see how these opinions differed and how the use of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was a little bit different between these great imams. The other type of hadith that there was debate upon is hadith mursal. Al-mursal, just a reminder or for the brothers that were not with us when we studied that, a loose end chain a loose end chain. Excuse me, for one second. One second. Technical problems. <laughs> I'm out of uh, battery here. Okay. The loose and chain narration on the Prophet ﷺ is a hadith that is narrated from the Prophet ﷺ, but you don't know who the Sahabi that narrated this hadith is. The, when you reach, when the, the hadith reached Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Ahmad, they will say, "Hadathani Ibrahim and Sa'id and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam." They would skip the Sahabi. You don't know who the Sahabi. That directly heard it from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the, the ulama, the scholars, the imams differed about how to use that evidence. Now, this is a hadith that is definitely does not reach the level of authenticity as any of the three that we just discussed. But how did they use it? One school rejected entirely all hadith mursal. All hadith that is mursal was rejected by many. Uh, uh, many muhaddithin, like Imam Nawawi, uh, he would, uh, he would uh, consider it a weak hadith. He would not consider it an authentic hadith or a hadith sahih. The second opinion is this opinion of Imam Shafi'i. Imam Shafi'i would accept mursal, would accept the loose and chain, but he had conditions. Number one, he had conditions on the tabi'i. The last person that narrated the hadith, which is the tabi'i, not the, not the sahabi, he would accept it. And he specially accepted Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. He specially accepted the, what called Mursalat Sa'id, the Mursal of Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. Because he knew that Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib met great number of sahaba. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, he lived where? In Medina. In Medina Munawwara. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib was raised among the sahaba when we studied the life of Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. So he would trust the Ursal Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. Uh, and he also knew the, the methodology of Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. When Sa'id would say, this is from such and such Sahabi, that means he heard it only from that Sahabi. But when he made Ursal loose end, that means he heard it from a lot of Sahaba. So actually, in the mind of Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, when he does not mention the name of the Sahabi, it's a stronger hadith than when he mentioned the name of the Sahabi. So Imam Shafi'i accepted Mursalat Sa'id. And then Imam Shafi'i put some conditions on the Mursal that there should be shown no contradiction, there should be another hadith that would support it, and other conditions that we will study insha'Allah and when we study the life of Imam Shafi'i and the school of Imam Shafi'i. But there has been differences among these scholars about whether to accept Mursal or not. But Imam Hanafi, 
Al Imam Abu Hanifa accepted most of the Mursal. So you see how Imam Hanafi is really, Imam Abu Hanifa has been accused of leaving the textual evidence, and you see his methodology really tells you otherwise. He accepted Mursal, and he would accept Mursal for Tabi'i Tabi'i. He would accept Mursal that you have two layers missing. But he also had conditions that that person has to be trustworthy and etc. And one of them was Imam, he would accept the Mursal of Al-Hasan al-Basri. The methodology of Al-Hasan al-Basri, he would say, the minimum of Mursal, he said, إِذَا اجْتَمَعَ أَرْبَعَةٌ مِنَ الصَّحَابَةِ عَلَى حَدِيثٍ أَرْسَلْتُهُ He would say, at least if I have four Sahaba to exactly tell me the same Hadith in different occasions, then I would make it a Hadith Mursal. But if he said, this Sahabi told me, then that is, he heard it only from that one Sahabi. And then in one other narration, uh, Hassan al-Basri said, it has to be more than 70, 70 Sahabi to tell him this Hadith, so he can make it a Hadith Mursal. So Imam Abu Hanifa accepted it from, from Al-Hassan al-Basri, and he accepted it from the students of Al-Hassan al-Basri. Not only from, because he knew the bar was set too high. And Al-Hasan al-Basri. So you see how important knowledge is when, you, when it comes to ilm of hadith. But that also explains about some of the differences between these ulama when they come to accepting hadith. The third uh, method of Imam Abu Hanifa is Qawlu sahabi Is Qawlu sahabi the ruling of a sahabi, of fatwa sahaba. There are some types of, the different types of sahaba ruling. One of them is the ruling of Sahaba that where a personal opinion is not a factor. We said before that Imam Hanafi, Imam Abu Hanifa accepted some fatawa from the Sahaba and rejected some, right? And now we study why. Why he accepted some and why he rejected some and there are some differences between him and other schools. He said if there is no opinion in it and a Sahabi gave this ruling, then he would accept it. For example, when uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, when they were speaking of the menstrual period, right? what is the minimum and what is the longest that is accepted of menstrual period for wudu, for tahara, for Qur'an? There is no hadith. There is no hadith that tells you the minimum that you can accept in fiqh for that is such and such. But uh, Anas ibn Malik, Uthman ibn Abil As both said the minimum is three days and the longest is ten days. Right? After that, even if there is continuous uh, bleeding, you, you can go on and, and make wudu and salah and etc. How did that come up? It's a qawl sahabi. It's a, it's, an, it's a narration of a sahabi not narrated on the Prophet wasallam. But Abu Hanifa accepted that. There is no opinion. I mean, they didn't come and say, let's think about this. Right? They had to have some evidence. You cannot put the mind, why 10 days? It seems like an arbitrary, why not 9, why not 11, right? He said, this type of ruling, there is no ma'qul, there is no using opinion in it. So it's not an opinion of a sahabi. He must have gotten it from somebody else, most likely the Prophet wasallam. So he would accept that ruling from a sahabi. Another ruling, when the opinion of a Sahabi is based on knowledge. For example, uh, when he, Abu, Ibn Abu Hanifa gave a fatwa that if a slave in a war, in a state of war, gives safety to a person, an enemy, give him aman, what's called aman, then that is not considered a valid safety vow. It's not a valid pledge. Then he heard that Umar ibn al-Khattab allowed it. There is no hadith in that. So he would accept, and then he reversed his ruling based on what Umar ibn al-Khattab said, because he knows the level of knowledge of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab would not give a ruling with that knowledge, or arbitrarily. And even if he did, he's one of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. He can do that, right? If, it's, there is no, if there is no uh, ruling in Islam. So generally, he accepted the opinions of the Sahaba as well. So if there is a matter that opinion does not play a role, or if the opinion of a Sahabi that is known to be a learned Sahabi, of the Prophet ﷺ, he would accept that. Now, there are some rulings when there is conflict among the Sahaba. The Sahaba themselves had conflicts. 
and there is no evidence beyond the Sahaba. And then he would make his opinion. Then he would consult his knowledge and intellect. Like these two hadith, one on Abdullah ibn Umar, the other one is on Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, right? And they, each one tells us how to pray differently. And then he would choose one. He would choose one and reject the other one. So to say, you know, this is, this is a hadith, this is not a very good example. But still, this is how the Sahaba narrated the Salah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a ruling of a Sahabi or a narration of a Sahabi. When there is conflict, when there is disagreement, then Imam Abu Hanifa would reject that. And is that clear to this point? The fourth uh, source of jurisprudence in Imam Hanifa is agreement. And agreements, Imam, the school of Imam Hanifa accepted agreement by all means. There was no debate in the school of Imam Hanifa about agreement. Although this is very strong in the school of Imam Shafi'i, right? But Imam Hanifa accepted agreement and he accepted what's called uh, Al-Ijma' Al-Qawli, declared agreement, where the scholars all agree and verbally they, they say that. Or Ijma' Sukuti. Uh, as long as there is no coercion, when there is all silent agreement. One scholar gives a ruling and nobody objects, as long as there is no coercion and free will. So, the school of Imam Abu Hanifa accepted the agreement. The fourth, the fifth one is Qiyas, is comparison. Now, comparison is a big deal in the, uh, school, in the school of Imam Abu Hanifa, because it's a major source of jurisprudence, but is also accepted by all four schools. Qiyas is not rejected by any uh, school, but it is heavily depended uh, by the Hanafi school, and we studied what Qiyas is, is extrapolating a ruling on a new issue, which is called the branch, al-fara', after comparison with original issue, it's called an asl, uh, because of a mutual link, because of illa, and the reasoning behind the original ruling. And the, the example to that is marijuana, is prohibited, is forbidden, just like wine. Because they both are intoxicants. They both lead to intoxication, and that is qiyas. And that is also highly accepted by Madhab Hanafi. Number six is al-istihsan, preference. Now there is a major disagreement on a preference. And preference is, تَرْكُ الْقِيَاسِ الظَّاهِرْ لِدَلِيلٍ اقْتَضَى هَذَا تَرْك Preference is to leave the ruling of comparison for a better reason. For a better reason. And this uh, istihsan was completely rejected by Shafi'i. This is completely rejected by Shafi'i. So you need to know that there is some disagreement in these two schools. Imam Shafi'i wrote a book called Ibtalul Istihsan. Ibtalul Istihsan, rejection of istihsan. While istihsan was heavily used by Imam Abu Hanifa, it was used by Ahmed and Malik but to a less degree to a less, much less degree. Minimal use by these two scholars, by two school imam. But Imam Abu Hanifa used istihsan heavily. An example of istihsan for the brothers that were and sisters that were not with us last time, for example of that is su'ru siba' al It's the, if you have a water that is clean, and a dog came and drank from it, he cannot use that water for wudu. Because the dog is not considered a clean animal. But if you have the same water and an eagle comes and drank from it, if you compare the two situations, this water should also not be clean now because this is a meat-eating animal and this other one is a carnivore, is a meat-eating a a a bird. But then istihsan, which is leaving the comparison, rejecting the comparison for a better reason, says that the dog has a saliva and that saliva is dipped in water and, and it, it makes the whole water dirty. While the eagle takes water with its beak and it does not leave much in the water itself. So that for that reason you reject comparison, you reject qiyas and you take istihsan. Uh, Imam Shafi'i completely rejected that type of comparison and that type of intel and said, Man istahsana faqad sharra is making up a religion. You can make up a new religion based on this type, if you know, if you take it too much. So, obviously, you have to have a lot of knowledge when you're using these tools, and you know how to use these, this knowledge, like Imam Abu Hanifa. But that is one of the differences between Madhab al-Hanafi and other Madhab, is the dependence of istihsan. Uh, another is, the last one is al-Urf, 
common practice among people. Now, al-urf is with the common widespread practice in a daily living affair that is accepted by the intellect and it's accepted by righteousness, accepted by righteous people. Righteous people. And Abu Hanifa, dependent on urf, because if you remember who Abu Hanifa is, Abu Hanifa is a merchant. Abu Hanifa is a very practical man. Goes to the marketplace, deals with people day in and day out, buys and sells, and he knows that our religion is not been put to uh, to become a hurdle for our daily living. It's to regulate it, smooth it, and make it a practice. Islam is a very practical religion. So things that are practical, like astusna, like buying a contract. Uh, for things that are not made and paying for it and receiving money for it. It facilitates trade and it facilitates commerce and it facilitates industry. And although in Islam you cannot sell something you don't actually have in your pockets or in your safe, is haram, but in this particular issue because of the urf, then it is allowed. And that is also accepted by many other imams. Now I'd like to speak about some of the controversies, we're running out of time here, that were around the Hanafi school. Some of the ruling on issues that have not occurred. This is called Al-Fuqh Al-Taqdiri. Some of the criticism against Hanafi school is that Hanafis would sit around and imagine a situation that could happen and come up with a ruling for it. Right? And it is one of the things that, uh, that is a uh, uh, funny story is when Imam Qatada came and met in Al-Kufa. So Abu Hanifa wanted to test him and he said, مَا تَقُولُ فِي رَجُلٍ غَابَ عَنْ أَهْلِهِ أَعْوَامًا فَظَنَّتِ امْرَأَتُهُ أَنَّ زَوْجَهَا مَاتْ فَتَزَوَّجَتْ ثُمَّ رَجَعَ زَوْجُهَا الْأَوَّلْ مَا تَقُولُ فِي صِدَاقِهَا He gave him a question, he said, what do you say about a woman? that was married to a man. And this man traveled and he'd never come back for several years. So the woman thought he was dead and she married another man. And then after she married another man, the first husband comes back home. Is he entitled to his dowry? Is he entitled to the money that he paid to get married for that woman? And then Abu, Abu Hanifa turned to his companions, to his students, and he said, لَإِنْ حَدَّتَ بِحَدِيثٍ لَيَكْذِبًا If he told you a hadith, then he's telling you a lie. There is no hadith about it. Okay, he knows very well. وَإِنْ حَدَّتَ بِرَأْيِهِ لَيُخْطِئًا And if he told you his opinion, then he will make a mistake. Because Imam Qatada is from the school of text. Right? Text, he doesn't know how to use the tools of Abu Hanifa. He said he can't give you an opinion. And the, the narrator said, صَمَتَ الْإِمَامِ Then he became silent, silent. And then he turned to Abu Hanifa and he said, أَوَقَعَتْ هَذِهِ الْمَسْأَلَةِ Did this really happen? And Abu Hanifa said, no, it didn't happen. And Abu and Imam said, قَتَادًا لِمَا تَسْأَلْنِي عَمَّا لَمْ يَقَعْ Why are you asking me about things that didn't occur? And Abu Hanifa said, إِنَّا نَسْتَعِدُّ لِلْبَلَاءِ قَبْلَ وُقُوعِهِ We prepare ourselves for things like this before it happens. So when it happens, we know how to deal with it. فَإِذَا وَقَعَ عَرَفْنَا الدُّخُولَ مِنْهَا وَالْخُرُوجَ مِنْهَا so this is called Madrasat al Ara'aytiyin. In Arabic when you say, let's suppose, what, what if this happened? You say, Ara'ayta, Ara'ayta if this happened? And this is called al Ara'aytiyun. And they were hated by many, many, many scholars. Because they come up with the most difficult questions. And, and for many scholars, this is a total waste of time. But in the school of Abu Hanifa, this is preparing yourself for what if this happened. And there's this is, Two different opinions, and you can follow whatever you want. But Imam Abu Hanifa was criticized heavily by his contemporary people for using this method, for imagining things and then coming up for, for the rulings uh, for these particular things. Another criticism for Abu Hanifa was that he was accused to have weak knowledge of hadith. That Abu Hanifa have weak knowledge of hadith. He's a قليل البضاعة من الحديث. And this has been refuted by many scholars that Abu Hanifa actually was a very good, uh, had a great knowledge of hadith. That he knew thousands upon thousands of hadith and uh, he le- used it and he used it for his fatawa and most of it was reported by his students. 
It is, he is not like Imam Ahmed, who is a scholar of hadith. He is not like Imam Malik, who is an author of a major book of hadith. But he had great knowledge of hadith. And one of his books is Kitab al-Athar for Abu Yusuf. Another criticism for the school of Imam, uh, Imam Hanifa. Did Abu Hanifa prefer his opinion over textual evidence? I went over that a lot by the, by the words of Abu Hanifa, by the words of his students, and by the methodology that he actually used. There is no preference. He would use opinion a lot, but there is no doubt when Abu Hanifa was faced by textual evidence that is authentic, he would never go beyond that. And he would go with this authentic source. Few words about the students of Abu Hanifa. The students of Abu Hanifa are very important in spreading the, the Madhab al-Hanafi. And the Madhab al-Hanafi, according to most Muslim scholars today, is the most spread Madhab in the Muslim world. Most Sunni Muslims are Hanafis. And, and this is really a demographic fact. So how did that happen? It is because of most of his students. And if you don't, if, if there, he had, of course, many, many students, but these three are very important to know. First one is Abu Yusuf. Abu Yusuf is, his name is, uh, Ya'qub ibn Ibrahim al Ansari. He's from the Ansar, and his name is Ya'qub ibn Ibrahim. And Abu Yusuf wrote two major books in Fuqh al Hanafi Kitab al Kharaj wa Kitab al Athar. Kitab al Kharaj handles things that are related to money, and Kitab al-Athar is actually written by his son, Yusuf ibn Abi Yusuf. And Yusuf, uh, he wrote many hadith and many sanad, and that actually shows the strength of Abu, Hanif, of, 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 of Abu Hanifa and the knowledge of hadith. But most importantly, Abu Yusuf became a qadi, became a judge. And then he worked for three khulafa in, Abbas, in Bani Abbas. And then in the time of Harun al-Rashid, he became chief justice. He became Qadi al-Qudah. You cannot appoint a judge unless you go to Abu Yusuf. So guess what? Abu Yusuf appointed all his Qudat from the Madhab al-Hanafi. And he sent them everywhere. And the Madhab al-Hanafi spread everywhere. And that is, was very major, uh, uh, it was very important issue why the Madhab al-Hanafi was widespread. is because of the importance of Abu Yusuf in the Abbasi Khilafa, and the Madhab al-Hanafi became the official Madhab of the Abbasid. Another important scholar is Muhammad ibn al-Hassan. Muhammad ibn al-Hassan was the scholar that actually documented the Madhab al-Hanafi. He wrote many, many books. Among them, something the Hanafis called Al-Kutub al-Sitta, six books. These six books, this is until today, the scholars of Al-Madhab al-Hanafi depend on them. These are the references of Al-Madhab al-Hanafi and the methodology of Abu Hanifa. And they're all written by Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan. And these books are called in the Madhab al-Hanafi, Kutub Zahir al-Riwaya. And there are the book of Al-Mabsut, Al-Ziyadat, there's Al-Jami' al-Saghir, Al-Jami' al-Kabir, Al-Siyar al-Kabir, wa Al-Siyar al-Saghir. And these are called the fundamentals of Al-Madhab al-Hanafi. And they're all documented by Muhammad ibn al-Hassan. The third scholar that came out of this is Imam Zufar ibn Hudayn. And Imam Zufar was one of the best people, best scholars in the Madhab al-Hanafi known in his methodology of comparison and opinion. And he was, many people said he came up to the level of Abu Hanifa himself. And then lastly, the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa was widespread in the Muslim Ummah. Most of the eastern part of the Islamic uh, world is mostly Hanafi, heavily Hanafi, greater than 90%. Muslims in China, Muslims in Afghanistan, Pakistan, the subcontinent, and to the east, most of them are Hanafi. More, most Muslims in Turkey and the Ottoman Empire are Hanafi. In Asham, at least half of the Muslims in there are Hanafi, and the other half is probably between Shafi'i, very few Hanbalis. Uh, in North Africa, it's a minority. The Madhab al-Hanafi is a minority in North Africa because of the Fatimid. The Fatimid were enemies of the Abbasid. The Abbasid were Hanafi. So the Fatimid were actually an extreme Shia, but they allowed some uh, scholars of Sunnah to work, but they said no Hanafis are accepted. You can either be a Shafi'i or a Maliki. And that is it. 
and that was uh, actually the most of the uh, the, the uh, Muslims uh, in Egypt today are Shafi'i. Most of the Muslims in North Africa and Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia are Malikis. And the Madhab al-Maliki was also widespread in Andalusia. And Madhab al-Zahiri was also widespread in Andalusia. So most of the Hanafis live from Asham on eastward, uh, and then north to Turkey and to the Balkans. All, most of the people that live there are Hanafis. I have to stop here. There was a very beautiful will or recommendation that Abu Hanifa left for his students. Maybe we will share it uh, with you some other time. And it just gives you uh, a little light about the life of and, and how Abu Hanifa felt uh, about his students and his knowledge. And we will leave it for some other time. Uh, we have no time left for Adhan Aisha, so I apologize for not leaving much time for questions. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فيا فوز المستغفرين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين